Hello, my name is Jennifer McClendon, and I am the Senior Manager of Education and Mission Programs for the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition. And today I will be, be providing you with some information about clinical trials, the importance of clinical trials, and what questions you might want to ask your doctor about clinical trials. To start off, every year, millions of people make the courageous decision to participate in clinical research. Participants form a partnership with researchers and health professionals and play an important role, really a heroic role, in advancing knowledge about ovarian cancer and how to treat it. So what are clinical trials and why are they so important? Well, the formal definition of clinical trial research, trials are research studies involving people that are done to try to answer scientific questions and to find better ways to safely prevent, detect, diagnose, treat, or improve quality of life. I prefer a more simple definition that clinical trials are the best way to ensure that a safe and effective new either medicine or technology can be developed for patients who need them. And notice that clinical trials aren't just for treatments, they address a broad range of topics, including prevention. But today I am specifically going to be talking about cancer treatment trials. And for many women with ovarian cancer, um, it's these investigational treatments that may offer new hope. And they are critical because without clinical trials, we may never know more uh, about ovarian cancer, uh, you know, either how to detect it or how to treat it. We may not know more than we do today. So whether a new therapy or screening or diagnostic test becomes part of standard treatment for ovarian cancer largely depends on the results of these trials. So who participates in clinical trials and what are the risks and benefits? People participate in clinical trials for a variety of reasons. Healthy participants say that they participate to help others in the future and to continue to help move science forward. Participants with a disease such as ovarian cancer participate not only to help others, but to also possibly receive the newest treatment and to also have additional care and attention from a clinical trial staff. So clinical trials in general can be offered to many different types of individuals at many different stages. One of the things I'd like to point out is that many think in general that clinical trials are a last resort and are only offered to those patients who may have run out of treatment options, but this really isn't the case. Each study has its own set of rules about who can and cannot participate. And this is, based, this is based on something we call eligibility. So your eligibility may be based on your age, your gender, your overall health, and the type and, disease, the type and stage of the disease you have, um, as well as maybe some other health conditions. So not everyone is eligible to, to participate in a clinical trial, but it's a great question to ask your doctor at the beginning of your diagnosis, simply, you know, am I eligible for a clinical trial? Here are just some of the risks and benefits related to being in a clinical trial. Some of those risks include that the new treatment may turn out to be no better or worse than the standard treatment. There may be unknown side effects. There may be possible extra office visits and tests. Some of the benefits include you may be the first one to receive the best new treatment or diagnostic tool. You're closer, uh, closer under supervision. Um, you're closer to the medical team than usual. Um, and there is also there, of course, that opportunity to help future patients. But I also want to stress here that placebos alone are never used in treatment trials specifically. They may be used in phase three trials, which we will talk about here in a second, but they are never used alone. They are always combined with the standard of care. And um, this, uh, this idea of, of a placebo is definitely a barrier to some who think of this as a risk, but placebos are not used in clinical trials where participants will be harmed 
if they do not receive a real medical treatment for their condition. So participants will either get the new treatment and or the current standard of care that is available. But we have a problem, however, in the number of individuals that take part in clinical research. Not only is clinical, and tri uh, clinical trial enrollment less than 5% of adults uh, here in the United States, but of those uh, participants, fewer than 10% are members of racial and ethnic communities. And this is where certain cancer mortality rates may be higher. And underrepresentation of women of color in trials is a real problem because without these women, the differences in genetics cannot be studied, which affects the progress of trials and research and the potential of a cure to be found. So it is crucial that we increase participation numbers in these communities so that we can continue to benefit from new uh, treatments and hopefully one day a cure. So there are four main phases of clinical trials and each phase really allows researchers to ask and answer questions as the trial progresses to ensure that their information is not only reliable, but to also protect the patients as the phases progress. So in phase one, the question here that we're looking to answer is, is the treatment safe? Researchers first test a new drug or treatment in a small group of people in phase one trials. This includes around 20 to 80 individuals. And in this phase, we're evaluating the safety. We're determining safe dosages and identifying any side effects. In phase two trials, the question here is, does the treatment work? The study or drug, uh, the study drug or treatment is given up to a larger group of individuals, anywhere from 100 to 300 to see if it is effective in treating ovarian cancer and also to further evaluate safety. In phase three trials, the question is, is it better than what is already available? So this phase that you might hear about the most are really looking at how well a new treatment works compared to the current standard of care treatment. This phase typically involves more people up into the thousands, um, approximately 3,000 individuals, and they last longer. The, um, the phase three studies uh, look at the, the best way to give the new treatment to get the most benefit. Participants in these trials, phase three trials, are randomized. So they're chosen by chance to either get the new treatment or the current standard treatment. And it's results from these large randomized trials, which lead to changes in treatment guidelines. Once this phase is complete, if the trial results show that the new treatment is more effective or is safer than the current treatment, a new drug application or an NDA is submitted to the FDA for approval. In phase four trials, the question is, what else do we need to know? The focus is on the long-term effectiveness and side effects of the drug, and it's conducted over an extended period of time. So there still might be a few questions about the new treatment that are addressed during this time, such as quality of life issues and cost effectiveness. Clinical trials must follow a strict plan called a protocol. The protocol follows medical, ethical, and legal guidelines to ensure patient safety. The protocol includes detailed steps and procedures that are to be followed during the trial so that there is consistency across the country by all who enroll in trials, and so that those results can be combined and trusted. And as part of the protocol, and as I mentioned a few moments ago, patients may randomly be assigned to one of two study groups. Again, one group receiving the treatment being researched and one receiving the current standard of care treatment. Before enrolling in a clinical trial, all patients will sign an informed consent form. And this form describes what will be involved as you participate in the trial. It is also a legal record 
that the patient understands what will be involved in the trial. And it also makes note that you can really drop out of a trial at any time for any reason. It is advisable to bring along a family member or a friend with you to your appointments to learn about the process of the clinical trial, and they can also help you to take notes and step in with questions if needed. And here are just some of those questions that you might want to ask the doctor. Is a clinical trial a treatment option for me? And this can be asked as soon as you are diagnosed. Am I eligible to, to participate? Why is the study being done? And what phase is the trial in? Will my insurance cover the costs? How long will it last? And what are my rights as a patient? One of the, the questions that is not listed here is, will you still be my oncologist? And it's important to note here that you will keep your same treatment team, but you will have the addition of a clinical trial team as well. They will communicate with one another, especially in this new virtual world. Most clinical trials take place at comprehensive cancer centers in major cities. But for most, so for most trials, you know, living near or close enough to a travel or close enough to travel to the center is required, but not always necessary. Some trials, although being done at a certain center, do allow for remote participation by the healthcare teams working together with telemedicine and remote patient monitoring. And I believe we will be seeing more of this in the future as well. Sometimes clinical trials may need to adapt and change in response to major health crises and challenges, such as what we currently find ourselves in with the COVID-19 pandemic. So there is a fundamental paradigm shift that is currently underway regarding how medicine is practiced and delivered. And we've learned some lessons along the way. It is possible that the way we conduct clinical trials in the future and that we're starting to really do now will be different. One way that researchers are working to adapt clinical trials today is by making studies more accessible through virtual visits, telemedicine, or by having a nurse or health professional be able to visit the participant's home. This may not only be safer for some, but it is definitely more convenient, especially for those that live far away from the research center or those that have difficult traveling, difficulties traveling. And other changes to trials um, that could be incorporated into future studies include the use of electronic signatures for a patient consent versus having to go into the facility to sign remote monitoring of clinical trial results, and possibly shipping oral medications directly to patients that are participating in the trial. So lots of advancements are underway. And today there are numerous resources to help find clinical trials. And with more trials being conducted by independent community-based physicians, there is a far greater chance that your physician or nurse will be able to help find the right clinical trials for you. And if you're thinking about joining one, the best place to start is to talk with your doctor or another member of your healthcare team, because often they may know about a trial that could be a good option for you. He or she may also be able to search for a trial, provide you with additional information, and answer your questions to help you decide about a clinical trial. Second, there are different online search engines that are listed here on the screen that you may be able to try and find a clinical trial on your own. They can be very overwhelming, so ensure that you have your doctor and or healthcare members uh, support and um, assistance in looking for these trials. If you have any questions about ovarian cancer in general, need to connect to local resources in your community, or you're just looking for some support, please feel free to reach out to us at the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, and we will do our best to help. You can find us um, online or contact us directly via the phone number here or send us an email. Thank you so much.